We drive by the homes every single day. You see them. They are falling apart. They are unoccupied homes right here in Sandwich. Now is the time to start talking about these homes, bringing awareness to what is going on with these countless structures throughout our town that are literally falling apart. Today we're at Aunt Sally's house. That's at 238 Route 6A here in Sandwich. Gully Street is right on the other side. That is today's house detective. We're standing in the backyard of 236 Route 6A, thanks to John Hollenberg, who owns this beautiful home. He just restored it himself. The closest that we can get to 238 Route 6A, which is affectionately known as Aunt Sally's house. The house is unoccupied. It's literally falling apart. It is without question unsafe. Unoccupied homes just like this one are becoming an eyesore and that everyone sees but no one wants to look at. That's what this show is all about. The House Detectives unpacks the story. What is the history behind it? This one has a lot of historical significance. Who owns it? What do we know about it? And are there any bylaws or legislation or anything that can be done to help preserve the home, especially if it is a an historic asset. Now note that we are not on the property of Aunt Sally's house because we have not been granted permission to do so by the owner. We have made several attempts to get in touch with this person, but therefore we are here at John's house with Aunt Sally's right behind us. So let's see what we can uncover with our house detectives and the house detective du jour is Amanda Haynes. Amanda is an attorney. She is on the Sandwich Historical Commission, um, and she has a furious curiosity into situations like this. Amanda, what do we know about Aunt Sally's house? And welcome to the show. Thank you, Greg. Uh, if you remember the last time we were talking, we were uh, in front of the Wesson Boathouse, which was prior to that, Nathaniel Freeman's ancestral home, if you recall. Yes. And when the Freemans died out, they came up with another use for that structure, that house, which was a school. And then there was a proposal made that it would be turned into an, an insane asylum. Fun. Yeah. Now, I'm sure that's not the correct term anymore. But no, no, it's definitely not. <laughs> but yeah. back in the 1880s, that's what we called buildings of that nature. And uh, the residents of Grove Street were not thrilled with the idea of it being any kind of facility for the mentally ill. So the proposal died. But the woman who made that proposal lived directly behind us. And her name was Alice Rebecca Cook. Okay. So we can see from this vantage point, while you may not be able to see it exactly on camera, it is literally right there. We can see the roof line. How far would you say that is away from us? Oh, I don't know. Maybe a football field? Maybe okay. Less. less than a football field. Yeah. Half a football field away. It's right there, but it's so overgrown, you can't even see the structure. But tell us about Alice, and what do you know? Well, the house was actually built in 1770 by Peleg Nye, and the Nyes are a family here that everyone sure. in Sandwich knows. Yeah. Um, but we're going to start 100 years later in 1880 when the history really gets interesting. Yeah. So in 1880, um, Alice Rebecca Cook, she was a nurse at the Tewksbury uh, Asylum for the Poor. And this was the state insane asylum. Um, it was a terrible place, very, uh, you know, Victorian in its sensibilities. And she was a nurse there. Uh, in 1885, Massachusetts passed a state law that private citizens could bring the mentally ill into their homes mm. and for $3.25 a week, take care of them. See, now my wife <laughs> is going to ask for 10 bucks because she thinks that's who she's living with. But that's beside the... Right. Topic. Well, prices have gone up. I'm prices sure have gone up. Exactly. But, uh, so she decided that she desperately wanted to come home. This was her uh, where she was born. It was her grandfather's house. Her mother, Abigail, her sister, Minnie, were living here and she really wanted to come back to Sandwich. So she decided that she was going to take three women, Irish women, who she called, this is terrible, but she called them her insane treasures. Nice. She, she was going to bring them home and take care of them. And that's what she did. And lo and behold, here arrived uh, Maggie, Jane, and Katie from wow. Ireland, um, very seriously mentally ill with yeah. delusions and um, manic depressive disorders mm. and a whole gamut of, you know, critically mentally ill symptoms. Right. 
So um, Alice came up with a novel <laughs> way of treating them, which was love, kindness, tenderness, and patience. And she also played the banjo, and that apparently helped a great deal uh, with soothing their troubled souls, as sure. she said. And it worked. Yeah. Uh, and this was unheard of at that time, but she actually transformed these women so that they were productive members of society. Now, yeah. she reported that they still suffered from delusions and might talk to other people that weren't there. Mm. But that was a symptom they could deal with because for the most part, they were able to dress themselves. They were able to do chores. Yeah. And uh, she wrote this very moving passage in this flowery Victorian prose about how she would let them go roaming. And these three women would go off in Spring Hill and come back with their arms laden with flowers and, and woodland vines and ferns. And wow. they would decorate the entire house. As she said, every rude receptacle was filled with beautiful wildflowers wow. in the corners. And they were piled up in, you know, every, no every room. And you can just imagine what a... Um, sort of beautiful little Garden of Eden in there. So just, I have the image of who lives there. Do you know anything about the actual house? How big is it? How many rooms, bedrooms at that time? Well, at that time it looked much different than it does today because okay. we can see that it used to have not only the uh, original three-quarter cape, but it had a wing and then it had a small, uh, what I would call almost a, a, a shed or bay window on the other side. And then behind the house was an, uh, an L that was the kitchen and attached to that was the woodshed. And that's where, uh, so what I just told you was very important at the time. Sure. Um, because Alice uh, Cook was operating this building as the Locust Grove Asylum from 1903 to about 1936. Okay. But that's not what this house is famous for. Really? Right. Tell me what it's okay. famous for. So, in 1915, yeah. um, Alice and her sister and her mother found a skunk that was injured. It had been hit in a car accident and they brought it back to health and they raised it and they set it back into the wild. The next year a family of five baby skunks arrived on their doorstep and they went through the same exercise. They took care of the baby skunks because they firmly believed uh, that animals and, and all human life, all life was sacred and they believed in the philosophy wouldn't hurt a fly. Wow. And so um, people they, and animals alike. Yes. Yeah. They, 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 right. As you heard, they had yeah. this very caring nature and they, yeah, this sure. was their philosophy. So um, as time went on, and I don't know how it happened, the skunks started coming through that woodshed that I talked about that's now gone because there was a, a cat port there. So even back at this yeah. time, they had, you know, cat Little blasts. swinging doors. Yeah. They got it at PetSmart, I know. <laughs> yeah, right. right. And so the skunks, I don't know how they figured it out, but they started coming through the cat port into the woodshed and Alice and her sister and her mother decided that they would feed these wild animals. Mm. And they created a dish called hearty, which was bread cubes soaked in milk and sugar. Mm. And they started to, I wouldn't say tame because these are wild animals, yeah, but sure. they started to feed them. And we have some great pictures of skunks yeah. coming into the woodshed and climbing into Alice's lap and being, you know, sort of like Pepe Le Pew lapping milk from a yeah, sauce. Yeah, right, you know? right. You can yeah. of, but it's not Disney because sure. these animals were vicious. I mean, they would fight and she describes, you know. All in that house yes, right behind us. Right. And, wow. Um, and after the skunks came the raccoons and then groundhogs and cats and... Uh, at one time she had, you know, sort of a procession of, of 40 skunks and 15 raccoons yeah. coming into the back of the house. Um, Give us the connection. Um, there is so much history and I can tell you're very excited yes, about this. Good. And this is not unique to Sandwich, which is one of those things where, as we're researching homes and we have a long list of homes that we're focusing on. The history runs so deep. Be, I mean, we're just referring to it as Aunt Sally's house. Mm -hmm. It is so deep. I, I know you have a, have so much to, to, to talk about, but let's bring in the connection of Thornton Burgess. All right, perfect. So Thornton Burgess, now he says he went to Aunt Sally's house, it was Rebecca Cook's house, uh, because he was interested in all the original sandwich glass that she had in there. And they were friends. You're, well, they, they, were, they knew each other. Okay. But in 1925, he goes to the house. He says it's for the glass, but he was also a big aficionado of skunks. He thought the yes. skunk should be our national emblem instead of the bald eagle. Oy. So he hears about these skunks and he goes and he starts um, documenting it by taking photographs and eventually home movies. And he gets so immersed in this skunk whispering that he actually puts, <laughs> he puts a piece of that hearty in his mouth 
and has his skunk take it from his lips. Hey! Which gets a little bit of, you know, yeah, ick, ick yeah, factor, but, yeah. you know, he was, he was down with it. So, yeah. Um, and that's how it becomes famous. And he eventually writes a book, and I, I have a copy of the first edition. His book is called Aunt Sally's Friends in Fur. Look at that. Yeah, that's the first edition that he wrote in 1954. And that's how it became Aunt Sally's house. With all the pictures yeah. of the skunks in the back. Yeah, we have some great pictures of the raccoons and the skunks. And, and he dedicated it to her. Yeah. And that's how the house became Aunt Sally's house. So let's bring it up to now. Mm -hmm. um, what do we know? Because we're introducing Bill Bowler in a minute. But uh, tell me a little bit about what you know of the owner today. All right. So what eventually happens is Aunt Sally gets to be in her 90s and she dies. And she gives the house to her caretaker. Uh, and he proceeds to sell it to these people, the Bells. And the Bells for many, many years, up until 1963 to 1990, ran an antique refinishing business called the Country Mouse. Mm. And people here in Sandwich remember this they business. They still remember yeah, it, sure. this isn't sure. ancient history by any means. Um, when they died, they sold it to a person by the name of Thomas C. White, who runs a business which is a woodworking business in mm -hmm. Centerville. Okay. And I, I pulled the articles of incorporation for the business. He's a Delaware corporation, but he's using this address as his place of business, which is a little hard to imagine. Yeah, we can't even <laughs> see through the, the shrubbery and the windows are open and God knows what's going on. So, right. okay, so, so there's a question mark there. Right, but under right. his... Uh, and ownership, we did reach out to him. Yes, we did several Multiple times. Multiple times. Yes, in different ways. And right. we got no response, okay. surprisingly, because under his ownership, the um, wing has been torn down. The kitchen has been torn down. The woodshed that's immortalized yeah. is the animal nightclub torn yeah. down. Yeah. And I was led to believe that the house has been gutted. Okay. Um, so if he's a woodworking business, maybe he's using the wood, I don't know. Sure. But um, in 2003, he took out a mortgage for $84,000 on this property. And the person who holds the mortgage uh, lives in the Virgin Islands, so okay. that's where we currently stand. So we have, we know nothing. We've made attempts also uh, with the building inspector here in Sandwich to learn a little bit about anything that was forced on the um, property, demolition, or for it to be wrapped safely with a fence. So we really don't know anything. So basically we're standing here next to John's house, which is beautiful, next to a house that is really just falling apart. Is this the definition of, and this is where I want to bring Bill in. Um, Bill Bowler, not to interrupt myself and change my train of thought, but it, it, it applies to you. You guys stand a little closer to me. Bill is the chair of the Dennis Old, the Dennis, Dennis's Old Kings Highway Regional Historic District Committee. He is the chair, has been for four years, uh, on the board for 14 years. So, and you're also a realtor. Yep. Real estate, homes, historic elements um, is very important to you. Um, how does this happen? And in your mind, your experience, is this the definition of demolition by neglect? Well, it's, it's definitely demolition by neglect. I think that's his intent. And yeah. It happens all the time. People buy an old house. They don't want it. They can't tear it down because it's in the historic district. So they let it go to rack and ruin, mm. bring the building inspector in. He condemns the building and forces it to be torn down. So we're talking about a historical building that goes to the 1700s. Right. Anyone in their right mind would say, oh, geez, checking the box to say tear it down is not a good thing, but also letting it just fall apart is not a good right. thing. What do all of us as residents in a community where we cherish history, um, what can we do about this? Well, I think the first thing, and just a little bit of history for people who don't sure. understand exactly what the Old King's Highway historic yeah, district please. is. It consists of all of the property, the land from Sandwich to Orleans, north of Route 6 okay. to the bay. It's the largest continuous historic district in the country. A lot of people don't know no that. No kidding. I, it's I didn't know that. No, it is, it's big. Yeah. You, you think about the, the size of that. And this is keeping a uh, watch on keeping historic buildings as historic as possible. Don't let them get torn down. Making sure that new homes are built in the Cape Cod style architecture within mm -hmm. reason. And it just, it's kind of a watchdog. Yeah. Um, what are you seeing in Dennis? Um, because here's, here's, the, here's the million dollar question. Well, let me get to the million dollar question in a bit. I want to learn a little bit about what you do in Dennis. You're a lifelong resident of Dennis. I've lived in Dennis my whole life. Yeah. I, hate to admit it, but I remember when this was the country mouse. Okay. Um, 
So right. that means you're in the age bracket of 90 to 120. <laughs> About 110, yeah. Okay, all right. Didn't <laughs> want to out you in no. any way like that, but that's just awkward. Uh, but you know about... You, you did it anyway. <laughs> I did it anyway, exactly. Uh, don't stop recording. The, um, the significance of a historic structure like this in Sandwich, um, look at it in, through the Dennis lens. Right. Could this be a house that you would see in Dennis? It could, yes. And okay. we've had some demolition by neglect in Dennis. The places have gone too far. Um, but we've also had some that we have saved. And right now, I, I was talking with the Dennis building inspector yesterday. Uh, there's an a old house in Dennisport on Lower County Road built in the early 1700s that has been abandoned. Mm. Doors were off, windows were broken. It was just left this way so that it would be get have to be demolished by, yeah. by neglect. Forces the inspector to say, whoa, gone too far. He is taking the initiative. And this is the, this is the biggest problem that I think a lot of towns have. He's taking the initiative to have at the town's expense go in and board the windows, board the doors, board a hole in the in the roof so that this place is not going to be just completely crumbled. Right. You preserve know? it in some preserve level it. of way preserve until it. more and then, then right. we can then we can work with it. Don't let it go completely off. You, then it has to be condemned. Yeah. Save it as and, much as possible. And this is a cape wide problem. Absolutely. And that's everywhere. The the my main problem since I've been on the historic district yeah. for fourteen years and working with the regional historic is who enforces these. Yeah. Now this this is this is a Massachusetts Act. Yeah. From nineteen seventy three. This has to be obeyed. Yeah. But what's happening is any anyone can put in a violation. You could go into town hall and you could put a violation against this property. Okay. And then they have to act on it. Okay. There's no certificate of appropriateness for, for the demolition that they've done. What I'm talking with the building inspector yesterday, and I knew this is what he was going to say, for him to tear down an L off of this building, you need a building permit. Yeah. And in order to get a building permit, you have to go through historic. Yeah. And to go through historic, and you, they go to the historic, Old King's Highway Historic District in Sandwich, and they're going to say, no, you can't yeah. tear that down. That's right. So he, but going ahead and doing it on his own right. is a violation. Yeah. And that and the, does the, happen. I, but the violation. But it's the enforcement issue. It's the enforcement. Yeah. It has to be, I almost hate to say it, but fines is really the only way yeah. that you get somebody to pay attention. Yeah. You can't just say, no, you can't do that or slap you on the wrist and it, it happens anyways. Right. You know, um, so then let me ask you why, and, and Paul Spiro is not here, he's our building inspector, um, but from our collective, geez, what do we think here? Why aren't these fines being um, I don't given know. to, yeah. I, I understand that if you put a violation in them and if it goes to court, the town doesn't want to pay court fees to go in because somebody painted their house the wrong color. Right. The judge and the, and the, the whole judicial system, they have better things to worry about. Right. The town doesn't want to go through the expense of going through courts. So yeah. my, gotcha. my solution would be find the people. On a daily basis, you can find them. Right. You know, but enforce that part of it to, right. to say to people, and it, it just brings some awareness yeah. to the owner, to the people in town. Right. It's, it, to me, it's kind of a win-win situation. Right. Maybe not for the homeowner who wants this thing neglected. Of course. But he's the one who is at fault. Yeah. And yet it's, it goes to the biggest thing, the enforcement. And yeah. that's, we, are, we, are, we do not enforce our own rulings. If I put in a uh, violation against this house, that's all we can do. We give that to the building department. It's up to the building department to do the enforcing. Okay. And if they decide they don't want to enforce it, there's not, we have no recourse. Yeah. Are you looking, at, you know, when you look at Dennis um, and you look at Sandwich in comparison, I'm not looking for numbers and str strategic, you know, or, or specific um, percentages, but do we have more abandoned homes that are falling apart than Dennis, uh, in your I, opinion? I honestly don't know. Yeah. Um, I, I really don't. Probably. Yeah. I so. Again, it's, um, like I said, it's, people have to be aware. Right. People have to know. If people get behind this, I think, to try to save this place, yeah. then 
I think it can be done. I, I obviously have not been in the house. Yeah. I have no idea what the condition is. Right. Um, but if it can be saved, it should be saved. So here's the plan, Amanda. <laughs> yes. And Bill, if you're in on this, after we shoot this, we're all going to go out and have some cocktails. And then we're going to go over and have a sleepover in there. And we're going to see how many skunks we can get in the house. <laughs> I'm in. Uh, okay. All right. And we're, we're just going to test it out. Amanda, Only if you Amanda, put the bread in your mouth. Amanda, yes. didn't, Amanda didn't say she's in. No. Yes. No, she hasn't answered, but yeah, she will. You know, in all seriousness, um, here we are standing in, in John's house here. Uh, he's so kind to let us um, uh, share shoot here. Um, he does not know the owner. He's not aware of it, but he is among many in our community that have a home that you cherish, a home that you take care of. You do beautiful landscaping and you do the siding and all of that and the inside work. But right over there is a house that has God knows what in it. Is it unsafe? Is it going to fall apart? And um, this show here with amazing research that you do, Amanda, and Bill, I really appreciate your, your take because there are lessons that we can learn, best practices. Um, uh, and that's really what the show is all about. Bill, let's end on one note. Is there something, if, if these residents here of Sandwich are watching this program right now saying, I, I think I wanna learn a little, give us a best practice that you have seen in your history uh, in Dennis that we could do here in Sandwich, what would that be? We have some people in Dennis and to be honest with you, the, the building inspector always hates to see them walk through the door yeah, because they're adamant about certain things in the historic yeah. district, whether right. it's signs, whether it's, you sure. name it, they're right. adamant and they follow through and they get things done. Yeah. I, one more other, other point that I just want to make sure, of course. is that we've had in Dennis, since I've been on the board, I think four houses historic houses that were had to be demolished because of neglect okay demolition by neglect just what, like what, aunt sally's house the, when the, every time the people have demolished the house they want to build a new house in its place yeah we all we, we will not let them tear that down unless they're going to build a replica of what was there interesting so four they, homes yep, and that so they'll build that. a replica was we let them add on to it on the back sure. or anything else but the main house has to be a, rec a replica of what was there. Wonderful, excellent. And, and then that works. Everybody, then, again, that's the win-win situation. Yeah. Y you lose it, but you're not losing everything. You still have something to gain. Yeah. Well, we are all about forcing the issue of discussion. I wanna thank Sandwich Community Television. These guys do a fantastic job helping us illustrate a story, a talking point, a message that we feel to be a, a very important one in our community. Thank you, Amanda Haynes, as always. We'll be back. Bill Bowler, okay. thank you so thank much. You. Thank Appreciate you coming from, from Dennis. You, uh, I'm Greg Anderson. We'll see you next time on The House Detectives.